Hello and welcome back to your new favorite podcast in your already favorite industry, Behind the Burner. Oh my goodness, it's been a couple of weeks since our last episode. I am super excited about the guest that we have for you today. You should be excited too. But before we get to him, Ray, welcome back, man. Good to do another podcast with you. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for doing this podcast with me, man. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Uh, we're on, geez, episode five, I believe. Times times are flying, um, but yeah, like like Josh said, um, you know my name is Raymond Bartolomucci. I'm also one of the co-hosts of Behind the Burner. This is episode five, and we are very very excited today to have a very special guest on the show, Steve Snower, the CEO of Parts Town Unlimited. Uh, if you don't know who Parts Town is, you probably already bought parts from them. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, we're really excited to welcome uh, Steve to the show. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, thanks, Ray, Josh. It's it's good to be with you. Um, not sure why I didn't get invited till episode five, but uh, so be it. <laughs> good. Awesome. Well, you know what? Usually, what we like to start off with is understanding your story. You know, who is Steve Snower? Uh, what is your background? And uh, Steve, take it away. You know, what's your story? Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, so, you know, really the, my business career story, um, and obviously my story is much more than that. It's about, you know, family, uh, you know, first, but my career story actually goes back a, a long ways. I, I really have distribution in my blood, um, so to speak. My, my father, who I was extremely um, close with, he, uh, you know, he died about 17 years ago. Um, but he and I were very, very close. Um, he was a great uh, father, and um, we were great friends as well. And he ran a very, very, very small uh, industrial supply distribution business, you know, in the Chicago area. Um, distributing like industrial and maintenance supplies, like a kind of a, a Granger, you know, type product line, but on a, a, a very, very small scale, had three employees. Um, and I grew up, you know, when I was um, young, I hung out with him uh, at his office um, around his little warehouse. Um, and uh, as I got older, you know, myself and my brothers, you know, had the opportunity to um, start getting a little bit active in the business, um, like, you know, during junior high and, and high school uh, weekends and summers, uh, started, you know, kind of sweeping the floors and filing paperwork and things like that, eventually um, filling out uh, the UPS book. So this was, you know, before there was any technology. Um, to work with, you know, UPS, where you'd actually fill this stuff out by hand. And I learned, you know, how to do that. Uh, eventually got to take uh, some calls from customers. And kind of the big milestone in our family was when you turned 16, you could drive the delivery van um, around Chicago. So, you know, my dad would write out directions, you know, for me to hand deliver product to uh, you know, factories and other, uh, you know, customers around the Chicago area. Um, so I worked with, you know, him and kind of learned distribution, you know, from the ground up, you know, I guess, so to speak, did kind of every job there is to do um, in a very small distribution business. Um, you know, after uh, I went away to college, um, my father, you know, encouraged me to go do something else, you know, for a while and not um, join the family business, at least not right away. Um, so I joined a distribution business um, called uh, Newark Electronics. It was a good-sized electronic component distribution business um, and, you know, started as an entry-level uh, financial analyst and eventually took on roles and uh, I became the finance director for the company, uh, moved into marketing, moved into sales. Uh, and this was really at the time when e-commerce was just becoming a, a thing. And companies at that point, you know, this is, you know, like uh, early to mid 90s, um, didn't have e-commerce departments and didn't really know exactly what to do with this. So 
it was often um, the marketing team or the IT team that got you know the assignment to look into this um, emerging digital you know landscape and. So I had the opportunity to, uh, you know, as the marketing leader at the time, to, to spend a lot of time on kind of early stage, you know, e-commerce capabilities, and um, you know, had a had a great experience for about ten years uh, with that company. Um, went back to school um, for a couple of years to get my MBA, and ran into a guy by the name of Bill Reedy, who some of your listeners uh, may know. He was the founder. Uh, of Partstown. So Partstown was founded back in 1987. Um, it was born out of a family business. And uh, I became, you know, friends with Bill um, during this, uh, you know, MBA program at Northwestern. And um, eventually, he caught on to the idea that I knew something about distribution. Uh, his background was more in service. And he asked me to come out and take a look at Partstown uh, and give him some ideas. Um, the business was extremely, extremely small. Um, five employees at the time, about $3 million in annual revenue. Um, and Bill thought there was an opportunity to grow and scale the business, but needed some different ideas. So uh, I went and visited, you know, Partstown. This was like, uh, you know, probably October or November of 2003. Um, came back with some ideas, you know, that led to more ideas and uh, eventually kind of, you know, the light bulb I think went on for both of us that there was a, a, a very significant opportunity here. And um, we created a partnership where um, Bill uh, became ultimately the CEO of his uh, family business. And I took on the Partstown, uh, you know, business and, you know, really, um, you know, started almost from scratch. You know, we had five people, but um, it was extremely uh, early stage and um, just started putting one foot in front of the other to, to build a business. So I've been with Partstown now. I'm sure we'll fill in some of the gaps through our conversation, but I've been with Partstown now for um, almost 20 years um, and, you know, seen it grow from you know, five people to, you know, over 5,000, you know, team members, you know, over that period of time, it's been a, a wonderful journey. Wow. Well, first off, congratulations on your success with parts down. I mean, what a wonderful, um, just a, it's just, just a testament to the industry and, and really, you know, the American dream within the industry is, uh, I think a good way to put it. I mean, that's, that's incredible growing a business in, in under 20 years from, from five employees to what, what you are now. Uh, that's got to take a ton of dedication and, and heart and perseverance. And I'm excited to talk a little bit about what, what that does take. I am curious. Uh, one of the things that you said was that Bill went uh, and he kind of, uh, started to run his family business while you took on the parts town side of thing. What, what, what was his family business? Was it a service side? Yeah. So, um, so uh, Bill's family business was a company that was called Reedy Industries and it was actually founded in 1930. Uh, and its roots were very much in service. Um, so uh, Bill's uh, grandfather was an entrepreneur kind of coming out of the Great Depression, um, you know, created a small um, field service business, technicians, trucks going out and fixing things. It, it, it started, uh, you know, actually a little bit more in the residential uh, appliance, you know, space, but moved into the HVAC space, you know, fairly quickly, mostly commercial and industrial uh, HVAC. So, um, you know, fixing heating and cooling units in hospitals, hotels, schools, um, factories uh, around the Chicago area. And it was actually kind of a, it's kind of a neat story. I'll just tell, I won't spend a ton of time on it unless you guys want to, but I'll tell you one interesting insight um, that um, Bill's father actually had. So his, his grandfather started the business. It was, you know, relatively small, of course, at the beginning. Um, his father, uh, Tom W. Reedy, you know, joined the business along the way, and he had a he had a 
this was obviously pre like GPS, pre cell phones, pre everything, um, you know, that we use today, you know, to run our businesses in terms of technology. And his insight was that a service manager was very good at running a business that had up to about 10 technicians. And when you had more than 10 technicians, it became very difficult for that service manager to be successful. Again, this was before all the technology that a lot has allowed us to scale businesses in different ways and lead differently. So what he did is every time the business got, you know, past that 10, 12 technician mark, he would just start another company, okay, and hire a new general manager and build that to 10 to 12, and then another one and another one and another one. So um, instead of creating one kind of big service business created a lot of small to mid-sized, you know, service businesses. And um, that was the business that kind of Bill, you know, ultimately, you know, took over. There were, you know, 20 plus service businesses, mostly doing commercial and industrial uh, HVAC. Eventually, Bill brought the food equipment service, um, you know, piece, you know, into the group um, and Partstown kind of spun out of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. You know, I ask because, you know, we talk a lot about the different trajectories available in, in these industries. And I think it's important for people to remember that Partstown is a byproduct of exactly that. Somebody who is a through and through tradesperson, right, that had been working, uh, looks like generationally, sounds like generationally, you know, through the skilled trades, uh, specifically, you know, mechanical. So I think that that's pretty amazing when you think about, you know, the success that Parstown has had and, and, you know, kind of the, the butterfly effect, if you will. So, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you were, you were, you, you're rooted in the very beginnings of, of Parstown. So you've seen this growth all the way, all through the years, almost the past 20 years. If you could pick say three things to credit the incredible growth of Parstown, what would those three things be? Yeah, so um, I would start with culture. Um, and really, I'll wrap that into culture and value. So I'm going to count that as one, not two, um, if that's all right. So um, culture and value. So one of the reasons that I wanted to come to Partstown and why, you know, I left an organization where I had, you know, whatever I was, I don't know, 30 years old or whatever, and I had a thousand people reporting to me um, at my old company, and I came to a company with five people. And the reason I wanted to do that, or one of the primary reasons, was the opportunity to build a culture based on a set of values from the very beginning. So I saw at my old company how culture um, can be your strongest competitive differentiation. It could also be your biggest challenge, okay, if you don't have it right. And it's very difficult to take, you know, a large established company and move the culture, you know, in a meaningful way. So I was like, you know, five people, okay, basically like a startup, you know, almost, we can really get the values and the culture right from the beginning here. So when I came in, one of the first things we did was we established the initial values. There were four at the time, there's six um, you know, now. And we held people to the standards that those values set. Uh, we hired people that fit the values um, and could add to the culture. And we kind of carefully crafted um, a culture that we thought could create um, a differentiating, uh, you know, capability in the business and allow us to, you know, grow and scale very successfully. So culture, and we can, of course, dive into any of these more. Um, well, if you want, if you don't mind me but, asking, what were yeah. the, what were the original four values and what are the six now? Yeah. So integrity, passion, courage, innovation, were really the the original four. At the very beginning, we termed them a little bit differently. So like integrity was actually called open and honest. 
Mm -hmm. um, as an example, but it was basically integrity, passion, courage, innovation, and really integrity was at the forefront of everything and still really is. It's, you know, the one value that just there, and we tell people that join the organization that we just will not, you know, sacrifice. There's no second chances for integrity violations. Um, we're going to do things, you know, with honor, with respect, with honesty um, every day. So integrity, passion, courage, innovation were the kind of the early stage values. Um, later on in our journey, we added safety, um, which actually became, we, we do these sequentially, so safety actually became the first core value because we realized that without keeping um, our people, our customers, our manufacturers, our operations safe, nothing else matters. Um, so uh, it became safety, integrity, passion, courage, innovation. And then more recently, I think in 2019, we added community um, to represent our passion for um, the uh, community of team members that we have, the industry community, you know, that communities that we live in that we're very passionate about, and also giving back to the communities, um, you know, that we we live and work in. Um, so, you know, as we sit here today, um, it's safety, integrity, community, passion, courage, innovation um, that we live by. Awesome. All right. I didn't mean to derail your no, your, uh, <laughs> your thought process okay. there. But, uh, all right. So culture and values is number one. What's number two? Yeah. So and uh, uh, the, the second one was kind of the other reason um, that I really wanted to take this on, you know, back in uh, January 04 is when I actually started. And it's technology. Um, and it ties to that innovation, you know, value. But what we've always looked to do is to be where the world's going in terms of technology and set the pace of technology change um, in the industries you know, that we serve. Um, and when I say, you know, that's one of the reasons that I came, if you remember, you know, kind of in the early part of our conversation, I talked about kind of being part of kind of early stage e-commerce, you know, at my old company in the mid 90s. E-commerce had become very well established, of course, by 2004 when I started at Partstown, but it, it didn't really exist in any meaningful way in the food service parts distribution space. So we looked at that and said, well, here's an opportunity to bring digital capabilities to an industry that doesn't have them, okay, that in, in a way that can make um, jobs easier, companies uh, more successful, parts e easier to find and buy and get. Um, so that digital piece was really important. Uh, it, it took us a few years because we didn't, we had no money. Um, you know, at the beginning of this journey, we had five people, there was $3 million in revenue, there was no profit, you know, in the business, um, you know, when I started. So, and we had to, you know, kind of, create our own future. Um, uh, like there was, uh, it, it was kind of a, a day by day existence, you know, for a while. Um, and really, our goal in those early years was, how do we build a business that creates enough cash so that we can actually go build this e commerce capability that we dream of. Um, so we got there finally in 2007. Um, so it took, uh, you know, a few years, you know, to get there. We launched the original uh, Partstown.com site, uh, you know, sometime in 07. And that led to a series of innovations in um, digital commerce, you know, for the space and parts findability. Um, also in, um, uh Sorry, my wife needs something. Give me, give me one one second. No problem. I'm actually I'm, I'm like doing a podcast on like a video. Okay. It's, it's it's mine's in there and Eden's is in the the uh, thing over there. 
Sorry about that, guys. I no hope problem. that uh, hey, all good. <laughs> oh, that's fine. All good. Create any issues for you, but when no, no, I no. need something, um, <laughs> I uh, no, no, not I, at I, all. I, I, I need to, actually, just to pay attention. Um, sorry, go ahead, Ray. Of course, I was actually going to say on that note, Steve. So with with technology in those early days, you mentioned you're from the e-commerce background, but when you started building all of this technology in the organization and thinking forward looking of what you were going to build, were you were you walk me through those early days? Were you at the whiteboard with with all of the yeah, founders yeah. of Parts Town, thinking, "Oh my gosh, how are we going to hire engineers? How are we going to build the technology <laughs> infrastructure?" You know, walk, walk me through that experience. Yeah, no, it's it's, uh, and it, I remember some of it, not all of it, you know, of course, but um, I, I very much remember there were three of us that were kind of at the core of bringing the initial um, site to life. And we absolutely like sat in front of, you know, a whiteboard flip chart envisioning kind of features and functionality um, that we thought, you know, could be valuable, you know, in this space. And, you know, we looked at other industries and what they were doing, what they weren't doing. Um, we asked questions. We all had our own experiences, of course. Um, but we really tried to, you know, like here's, here's an example, you know, maybe um, we tried to really understand a day in the life of a service company and a technician and envision kind of what technologies that are out there can really help make these roles and these companies more efficient and more effective as our customers and our partners. So um, like one example of that is we observed that in service companies and technician, um, uh, you know, trucks, there were binders full of um, technical information, you know, <laughs> about the equipment, right? Okay, there was binders from different manufacturers with different models and schematics and all this stuff. And I still have um, those right down here. I'm actually looking yeah. at them on my bookshelf. <laughs> you, still, you, still, you still see them around, right? And, um, but it was like, how can we take this library of information and make it digital, digital and accessible wherever the technician is. And that started, of course, on the kind of the main website of just creating basic abilities to download technical manuals. Um, we then added more and more features based on customer feedback and other insights. Um, and uh, of course, a big breakthrough was, you know, in 2010, um, we launched the industry's first app where then you could have access to this whole library of information wherever you were, you know, on your device. Um, and we kind of realized as we were going that most of our customers, you know, are primarily, you know, technicians, um, service managers, dispatchers. Um, they're, they're kind of on the go. They're super busy. You know, obviously the technicians, you know, are out on the road, um, and they need information to be there when and where, you know, they need it. So it was like, how do we do that? But it was Ray, you know, a lot of, you know, time kind of bouncing ideas off of each other, prioritizing those ideas. And fortunately we had built the early, um, kind of, uh, stage culture where we were, just really good, um, you know, we went through periods where we weren't as good at this, by the way, but we were really good at acting quickly on good ideas. Um, like another example was the 360 degree images, you know, that we brought, you know, to the industry in 2013. Um, that went to a, a lady named Emanuela Delgado, you know, in our business came up with the idea for this. Uh, this is kind of a fun, quick story. She came into my office. This was one of our old facilities um, back, I, I think it was in um, June-ish of 2013, um, if I remember the dates right. And she came over to my computer and she showed me that how you could spin the Trek mountain bikes around on the Trek website, the bicycle <laughs> you know, website. And she was like, what if we could do this with parts? Okay, what if we could create this type of technology? You know, we have all these images out there, but a lot of times the customers are calling us saying, you're taking the picture from the wrong side. 
you know, we need to see this side. We need to be able to zoom in. And she saw, you know, on another site how this was working. And we basically, like, truly dropped. We had an entire e commerce development roadmap that was going to last us the next year. We basically shredded it and said, <laughs> how do we bring this 360 degree image technology to life as fast as we can? Okay. And the, the, the concept, you know, that we, we always had was, when you land on a breakthrough idea, condense the timeline as tight as possible, you know, to bring it to life. So um, from idea to the launch of the first 25,000 images was like a 90, 100 day cycle time from truly from seeing the Trek mountain bikes to having 20,000 plus 360 degree images branded as part spin on our website. And it was, you know, a transformative, uh, you know, move. And um, that's kind of the type of culture. If you tie culture and technology yeah. together, that's kind of the way we operated back then. That's so amazing, Steve, because I I, I remember, you know, I, I grew up in the field. So I, I don't know if you know, but I, I used to be a technician. I spent like 10 years in the field. So, you know, I was kind of coming up as a technician as Parstown was just bursting onto the scene. Right. And so I'm as you're talking about this, all of this stuff you're talking about is ringing a bell. Like the part spin, like I know the day that that came out because I was like, oh, my gosh, like, look at this. I, I don't have to I don't have to call anymore and and ask if the if there's a little port on this side about this size. Yeah. You know, I can literally just spin the picture and zoom in now. So that's uh, this, this stuff is, is definitely resonating and I can see how it ties back to culture. That's really cool. So what was. I'm sorry, I, I I didn't catch the name of the person you said uh, that brought you the. Oh person. yeah, uh, Emanuela Emanuela Delgado. Um, she was actually one of the three. I mentioned there were three people that kind of worked on the original prototype for the the site. She was one of them, and she became um, really, and she still plays a huge role with the company today, um, leading you know our innovation practice. But she. Um, I credit her with a number of, you know, kind of breakthrough innovations, um, you know, over the years, but anyhow, go ahead. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So before I ask you for what the third thing is, Ray, did you have any more questions surrounding the technology piece? Um, no, I, uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say, you know, as far as the technology piece, um, we can get more into, uh, maybe what you see as maybe the open opportunities now. Uh, and maybe what, what, where you see opportunity with technology in today's world of food service. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a really good and important question. So, you know, the technology in the space has obviously come a long way, you know, for in parts distribution, you know, digital commerce, mobile, um, all the features within, um, in the service, um, you know, business as well. Um, technology, you know, has evolved, you know, quite a bit. Um, and, but it's going to continue to evolve and it's only going to move faster, you know, is the reality. Um, so, you know, if we think like the pace of change, you know, has accelerated, you know, over the past, you know, decade or two decades, whatever it is, looking back, looking forward, um, uh, if history tells us anything, the pace of change only accelerates. So, um, I think it's important to think about, you know, where is where is the world going? Okay, um, as new generations enter the workforce, how do they think? You know, how do they operate? And I, a lot of times, Ray, I like to think about kind of this next generation that's coming into the workforce now is really the first full generation that grew up with the mobile device in their hand. Okay. Like my generation was introduced to the mobile device after we learned how to talk on the phone and spend time with people face to face. And, um, and you know, obviously the, the mobile devices were transformative in all of our lives. But now we have a generation, you know, coming into the workforce that grew up with that and communicates very, very differently. Okay. Then, um, then certainly, you know, my generation did growing up. Um, they actually have a phone, but they don't, the phone feature is the thing that they use the least. Okay. On that, on that <laughs> device. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's used for social media and texting and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a completely different environment. So 
one of the things just broadly speaking that I think we all need to think about is as that generation comes into the roles that are important in our respective customer bases, how are we going to be ready, you know, to serve them? Because I think it's fairly unlikely that when we look back, you know, 15 years from now, that people are still going to be making phone calls all the time for what they need. Okay, that's that's it's going to evolve away from that. So I think there's a lot more digital, you know, technology, you know, um, coming, you know, in certain areas of the market. Um, I think. Um, you know, AI, you know, is clearly going to play um, some role. Um, what that is, it's kind of hard to figure out, um, you know, at this point. But, uh, you know, there's some powerful and useful, um, you know, elements, uh, you know, of AI that I think need to be thinking about. I mean, obviously, you know, IoT and connected kitchens and things like that are accelerating uh, more and more. Uh, but also for for a company like ours, like in the distribution business, we think of, you know, how technology can improve the actual physical distribution, you know, of the product. Um, so I think um, the the future will be less about distribution, like locations and physical, um, you know, places holding parts than you know, really innovative ways to move, um, you know, parts around and get them uh, where we need it that don't depend on, you know, physical location. So I think there's some really interesting, you know, innovations uh, and technologies, you know, coming there. Um, but it's going to be a more and more digital, more and more connected, um, you know, world. Um, our, our, our philosophy, by the way, is every year, we push ourselves to launch at least two innovations that the industry's never seen before. Um, and the reason that we have that philosophy is not because there's any magic to the number two and not all of our uh, innovations end up really taking off, by the way. We have a lot of failures you know, mixed in there. Um, but the reason we do that is just to make sure that our team is always innovating and always thinking about what's next and next and next and scanning not only our industry, but other industries and talking to customers and learning and thinking. Um, so I don't know, I'm not as good as, like I used to come up with a lot of innovations on my own. I'm, I'm kind of running out of ideas personally, but we've got a great team and there's a lot of great people in the industry that I think are gonna come up with some cool stuff. That's amazing. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. Uh, that's that's really cool. And and I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you interjected that last part about uh, the philosophy being launching at least two innovations the industry has never seen per year. That is that's pretty incredible to your point, even if they don't you, even if they don't take off. Right. You're still it's an it's a challenge to your entire team. Right. It's a it's a uh, you know, uh, it, it's it's challenging them to to push the industry forward and and to contribute in ways that, you know, uh, maybe they they don't even know they can. So. That's pretty awesome. All right. So we've got number one, culture and values. Number two, technology and the emergence of digital. What, Steve, is the third thing that you credit the incredible growth of Parstown to? Yeah. So, you know, this is a tough one. I was actually thinking about when you asked because there were two kind of layups in there, you know, for, for me. And I do that. A, I do that on there, purpose. <laughs> there's, there's a third one that I'm like, you know, what would be number three? Because I, I, I can kind of rattle off three, four, five, and six, but it's, it's hard to prioritize. I'd probably have to say the understanding that the most important thing to our customer was in stock availability of parts and the ability to get them where they need to go quickly. And every time we've done any level of rigorous data-driven research, it's always pointed to the part needs to be available. Um, so we can have like all this great technology and wonderful parts experts, um, you know, on um, the telephone and um, uh, great manufacturer relationships and all this other stuff. But if the part isn't in stock when the customer needs it, all of that doesn't matter a whole lot, okay? 
Um, so we spent a lot of time over the years refining over and over um, our inventory algorithms uh, and our philosophy to optimize, you know, in stock availability and for customers and really, you know, came to the conclusion that the the more parts you could have in one place, avoiding split shipments and maximizing quality, consistency, super late cutoff time, the better you get. And the business just works really well when the parts in stock and you take the order, you pick, you pack, you ship, you bill. Um, and when you don't have the part in stock, that's when all of the customer dissatisfaction, all of the extra phone calls, you know, all of the pain, you know, kind of comes in. So uh, I'd probably sum it up as culture, technology, parts availability. But then within that, you know, there's, a, of course, other things like, you know, manufacturer partnerships and sure, the ability sure. to grow OEM, you know, versus non-OEM and, you know, marketing, all of these other, there's lots of other stuff too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and I'm trying to kind of generalize, you know, your, your success in with parts town to where other people can kind of, um, you know, implement it. So I'm going to call the, the availability of parts, like the deliverability of product or service, right? Cause at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's really what you're saying is that the culture is great. The technology is great. All of that can be attributed to, you know, the growth can be attributed to, you know, but without the deliverability of the product, none of that really matters. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, and, and of course, you know, like everything ultimately flows from culture. So it's, you know, having great people that are passionate about the business and care about their customers that leads us to insights like parts availability yeah. and optimizing the inventory yeah. algorithms and looking at things a little differently. But yeah, you, you don't, you don't have the part um, that the customer is looking for. Um, you're not exactly a hero that day. <laughs> That's so, right. So, so Steve, but you know, when, when you have those three pillars and foundations, uh, what was your number one goal uh, for Partstown, like Envision? You know, you have all these components that play into that process. But when you started Partstown, what was that number one goal? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question. Um, I, you know, if you just personally say what was Steve's like number one goal um, with the company, it was really, I mean, you could think of things like, Build a great customer experience, you know, that's really valued. Build great manufacturer partnerships, grow OEM parts, be innovative. But I, I, I would say the, the number one thing for me was um, to build a unique culture based on a set of values that we could look back on decades from now when maybe we're not involved in the business, you know, anymore and be really proud, you know, of what we did. Um, and look back with pride and uh, just know we did things the right way and built some great relationships and friendships, created jobs, um, you know, along the way. That stuff, I think, um, is maybe more important than, you know, a lot of the other things that we get caught up in um, day to day. So I and I, I still stand by that today, Ray. You know, I just I want to be able for everyone that was part of this journey, you know, to be able to look back and say, I was part of something meaningful and special and something I can be proud of. That's yeah, amazing. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Really, really leaving the industry in a place better than when you found it in many ways and passing that torch to the next generations and creating a legacy. That's awesome. And that's, yeah, you, what know, and, about. you know, and I'll tell you this, you know, growth at the scale and the speed, uh, the pace of growth that we've seen in our business, it, it is obviously not easy, okay, in many, many respects. Um, and, you know, it could also be disruptive to others, you know, in and around the industry, you know, when a company, um, you know, grows and emerges, you know, and everything else. And I just, I think if you stay centered on the values and just you know, always do things with integrity, do things the right way, honor and respect, you know, everyone you come in contact with. Um, 
you know, you can leave, you know, the industry, you know, in a better place and, you know, create opportunities um, for those that follow. So you know, that stuff's really important to me. Yeah, I, I can tell. I think uh, me and Ray can both tell, you know, the way that you talk about culture and values is just there's a certain transparency and uh, you can tell that there's an, there's an authenticity to that. And, and you're very passionate about uh, about that that type of thing, which I think is super, uh, super important. You know, that's to your point earlier in the show, right? It's uh, culture is one of those things where it can be, it can be your best friend or it can be your worst enemy, depending on, oh. you know, how, w where the roots of the business are, right? We've had our struggles, you know, just transparently through the years of, of ensuring that the culture is sound because you're always going to have to choose between, okay, you've got this person over here that is just an incredible worker and contributor, you know, but maybe they don't match the values a hundred percent, you know, and it's always a limbo. It's always this tennis match. Well, what do we do? But at the end of the day, there's one clear answer, but you can't get there until you make the decision, you know, and uh, a lot of people out there will know what I'm talking about. I'm being a little cryptic about it, but you know, <laughs> you've, you've actually you know. said it beautifully. And, you know, I think that's an important lesson for, you know, anyone that's, you know, listening in. Um, if, if you have kind of defined values and principles, the answers can always be find, found in the values. Yeah. Okay. When the decision comes down to, should we go left or right? Should we go up or down? Should we choose A or B? Um, and if it's a tough decision and you're at an impasse and you're really wrestling with it, I think a great exercise is to say, go through the values and the culture and what you stand for and say, what does that tell you to do? And the answer will almost always be right if you honor that. Yeah, um, I love that. I, I do have one question surrounding the values. You said that originally integrity was open and honest. And I imagine maybe passion, courage, and innovation were multiple words as well at one point in time, maybe not. But was there was was it intentional to have one word values? Yeah, when we kind of um reformulated our values. We were kind of originally, we had the original four values. Uh, all of them were more than one word, you know, by the way. And then when we evolved that, our approach was, how do we simplify? Mm -hmm. Okay, how do we, and, and this is really important in our business overall, is simplify then scale. Um, and scaling complexity can be very hard, you know, in terms of you know, technology, because, you know, any, any aspect of the business, but that even, you know, exists with values. So what we said is that we were getting more and more people into the business. We were like, how do we simplify this down to one word um, uh, values? And then we'll put descriptors of what, you know, each value means. So it's not just integrity. There's a whole definition to integrity that we train, you know, our people on. Um, but we we did purposely move to one word and not every company does that and i've seen you know companies with wonderful culture and value systems that have full sentences but yeah. for us the one word you know kind of simplified version um we thought was effective and i'm happy we did that well that makes sense and and to your point i i think the the key is in the execution right whether it's one word or whether it's two or three words or a phrase or whatever you know the key is actually holding your people to your values and, you know, against your culture and, and, and doing that because you can have the best values in the world, but if you don't hold anybody to them, <laughs> then it doesn't mean a whole lot. That's Absolutely. right. That's right. And, for, and for, for companies that are watching this podcast that are repair companies, you know, with the labor shortages at the end of the day, culture is what attracts and retains talent. And for manufacturers attracting the best authorized service agents in the field, you know, how are, what's the culture of how you do business, but also with your people and your subcontractors. So it's a, it's a very important lesson for everyone listening to this podcast uh, to understand that culture really is the foundation to everything. And it's the building block to create a successful company. Uh, Steve, I, I have a question for you on the, on the Partstown front. Are there any exciting projects that Partstown's working on that are okay to tell our audience that are <laughs> loyal customers of Partstown? Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's some that are okay. There's some that probably are not okay. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to share at this, you know, kind of early stage, but we have, 
We have some, in, I won't get into depth here, but we've got some interesting kind of things going on with early stage um, use of, you know, AI to improve areas of the business and improve the customer experience. Um, so we're messing around with a few, uh, a few things there that we're uh, excited about. Um, nothing that's going to launch like in the next 90 days or anything, but we're doing some work there. Um, we're always, you know, working on, you know, technologies to help service companies um, grow and be successful. Um, we've got a, you know, a couple of interesting things, you know, going on that we think can create, um, uh, stimulate some additional growth um, for uh, service companies around the country and ultimately around the world. Um, help uh, them manage uh, cash flow and working capital more effectively, you know, while scaling. So we've got some some interesting, um, you know, technologies um, that we're we're working on, you know, there as well. Um, a lot of uh, our work it may, it may be a little less interesting, you know, to um, the audience here, but we're we're doing some really interesting things in Europe. Um, uh, you know, right now the business is grown quite a bit, you know, internationally in recent years. So um, we've got a lot of, you know, big initiatives um, over in Europe. Um, you guys may know uh, John McDonough, um, who's a terrific, terrific leader, um, who used to be the CEO of uh, Heritage, is now um, uh, the chairman, you know, of our Europe uh, capability. And he's he and his team uh, are doing, you know, some amazing things going uh, going on over there. Um, we're also doing some uh, exciting things with different product categories. So, um, you know, we've added residential appliance parts, you know, to our capability, you know, in the last year and a half or so. Um, and that's grown very, very substantially. And we have re very recently um, kind of did the formal launch of our HVAC um, parts offering. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time asking our customers, particularly service companies, what more should we carry for you? And HVAC um, keeps coming up and coming up. So um, we put, you know, a team around that and I think around a month ago, you know, launched, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the early stage HVAC parts capability. And that's um, that's grown maybe a little more than I expected in the early days. So we're, we're excited about that. That's awesome. Excited for, excited to, to see the launch of those things and, uh, and familiar with the recent launch of the HVAC stuff. Thank you, by the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I I've only got two questions left and they're easy ones and then we can, we can wrap up. I want to be respectful of your time too. But so one thing we didn't get into that I, that I want to is, and, and it loops around culture, right? It's the signature on your email is not CEO mm -hmm. of parts town unlimited. It is sixth man. Can you explain to me what that means? Yeah, um, I can. Uh, so part of the culture of Partstown um, is an aversion to hierarchy and an aversion to formality. So we're, we have a very kind of informal way of working, uh, you know, in the company. Um, and with that, we very, very strongly emphasize the team members that are taking the phone calls from the customers that are pick, pack, and ship, you know, the product as the most important team members in the company. Um, so what that lends itself to is like these formal, like traditional titles don't really resonate, um, certainly with me um, at all. Um, like I, I, I really, really don't like um, the title CEO, chief, anything um, doesn't really, you know, work for me. Um, and so we, we put in a number of years ago, we call them culture titles, but they're really the titles that we use within the business. So um, uh, we have some pretty fun ones, and I'll share a couple of them with you in a minute, but I'll, I'll, I'll first directly uh, answer your question on the sixth man. Um, you know, for a while, my title was town troublemaker. Okay, <laughs> that, was, that was the title for a long time. And because I was, you know, kind of the one that would stir up, you know, trouble and uh, within the business and, 
push people for new innovative ideas and Pace really change. challenge people. And um, I'm, I'm causing a little less trouble um, these days, maybe. Um, so we evolved uh, my title, The Sixth Man. Um, what it represents is really two things. Um, one is that I was the sixth employee of the company. Okay, so I was the sixth uh, person uh, to join the business. Um, and the other is if you think like a sixth man in basketball um, uh, is the first one off the bench that needs to support the team, you know, in every possible way to help the team grow and has to play different roles on different days. Um, and so we just, I just kind of liked that. Um, our, actually, our head of marketing, you know, came up with it. And I was like, yeah, that, that, that'll, that'll work for me. So you'll never see like if you know in my you saw my email signature, but um, uh, you'll you'll never see CEO um, on anything that I send around. Um, you know, external people will, will will say that, but it's just it's just not for for me. Um, and actually, I have to tell our people now because there's so many. You know, I mean, you you guys deal with this too, I'm sure, but all these cybersecurity threats and all this crazy stuff that goes on. Like, you know, people in our business are getting emails and texts from me like every day that aren't really coming from me, you know, anymore. So one of the yeah. things that I try to teach them is if something says CEO on it, it did not come from me. <laughs> um, so, but we, we, we've got these culture titles and um, like in our distribution center, you know, the title is OEM parts wrangler. Um, you know, these are the individuals that do the important work of um, putting the product in uh, in the boxes and getting them out to our customers. Um, our CFO, as most people might say from the outside, is Chief Money Maestro. And uh, she has a really fun one on her team. Um, one of our people is is called the, uh, in the in our accounting department is, is is called the Director of Kicking Assets and Taking Names. Um, <laughs> and uh, people always like that one. But we've got we've got a lot of fun ones. Um, and we just, we enjoy that. And I think it makes things a little lighter and less formal. Oh, that's, uh, that's awesome. And that's so true though, because at the end of the day, titles really don't matter. It's, it's, it's the roles and, and the responsibilities in the company that are really the driving force to do anything. Um, it's a great reminder for anyone out there. So, yeah, yeah. I, my, my dad, who still is involved in, in the business, uh, he, he, he signs the checks now, right? That's, that's kind of what he, uh, wh where he stays, but his business card still says service technician. Yeah. To your point. I love that. I just, I just feel like we're all, we're all just people, you know, playing different roles and supporting each other. And, um, we shouldn't, turn it into anything more than that. You know, everyone plays a different role, but we're all interconnected. And um, to me, you know, one role isn't necessarily more important than the other, certainly, you know, based on some uh, hierarchy or organizational chart. Um, uh, it's just about people supporting people and trying to do the right thing every day. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to move to wrap it up. But uh, last question for you, it could be a, a one sentence answer if you want, but uh, favorite book, Steve, I'm just curious. What, what's your favorite book? Do you read number one and number two? Uh, what's your favorite book? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I am not, so I, I'll put it this way. I'm not an avid reader, like in the traditional sense. Cause I, I, I read incredibly slowly. Like my, my single worst capability is my ability to read um like i can i can write i can speak i can good with numbers and everything else but reading is just it's exhausting to me because i'm kind of so bad at it um okay. so um you know i generally listen to you know audiobooks sure. um you know instead of uh reading um uh so i guess that's still kind of reading uh, you know, maybe, but um, yeah, I listen to, um, you know, audio books, uh, you know, much more often, um, you know, than I read. And, you know, I, you know, listen, I've, I've listened to a lot of good stuff, um, you know, over the years. I, I enjoyed, like, from a business perspective, um, I enjoyed the, the Jim Collins books. Um, 
you know, good to great, great and great yeah. by choice. And, and what, what I really maybe appreciated most, you know, in there, Jeff, was the, the leadership model um, that's outlined in those books, which is really um, what Jim Collins refers to as level five, you know, leadership. And really underlying that is the, the combination of ambition and humility, you know, yeah. in leaders. Um, and that's kind of what we look for in our organization and that I think is the most successful formula. It's finding people that are very ambitious, want to achieve, you know, lots of things, um, but are also very humble um, and realize they don't know everything and um, always uh, looking to learn uh, and improve um, and, you know, put the company above themselves and like to give credit to others and take blame on themselves. Like, yeah. it, I think it's a, it's a wonderful, simple model to follow. So maybe I'll just, just leave it at that. I could probably rattle off some other ones, but I think from business wise, that's probably the most helpful to me. No, that's, that's good. I'm a big fan of uh, Jim Collins. Also, it reminds me that what you just said and the little level five leadership reminds me a lot of, I don't know if you're familiar with Patrick Lencioni and his, his writings, but uh, humble, hungry, smart. You yeah, know, if you yep. haven't, if you haven't read that, uh, either you or, or our listeners out there, uh, really, really interesting model there that kind of uh, shows you how to uh, decipher the difference between somebody with ambition, humility, you know, humble, hungry, smart, what those all mean and how they intertwine. But uh, I won't take up, we won't take up too much more of your time. It's just, you know, thrilling to to get to talk to you and hear your story, man. Uh, lots to glean, lots to learn, both for myself, for Ray, and and for our listeners. So, um, on behalf of me and uh, and the audience, thank you so much, Steve, for spending your your valuable time uh, here with us today. Uh, I know that uh, time is precious, and uh, uh, we've we've taken quite a bit of it, but uh, not in vain. I'm sure a lot of people will learn so much from this episode. So, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you guys. And thanks again, you know, for uh, inviting me and for the service that you do um, to the industry um, through what we're doing right here and, uh, and also within your companies, um, uh, you do a great job. So uh, I appreciate it and uh, anything you can do to help keep in touch. Amazing. Amazing. Well, there you have it, everyone. Uh, Steve Snower from Parts Town Unlimited. Uh, Steve, thanks again for for coming on. You're an inspiration to myself and David, uh, building technology in the industry, and uh, we just really respect you and uh, and the and the brand you've built for the industry. So, thanks again for for coming on. Well, thank you. That that that, that means a lot. Um, wish you and families and friends uh, health and. Uh, wellness and uh, everything good in the world. So um, thank you.